Hi again, this is part two and we were studying about the history of London in lesson 110 and I just got over describing the English Republic under Oliver Cromwell and how they had invited the king back. Well London, that whole area being this the place where the kings and queens lived mostly um, was very very popular but it also had some terrible, terrible tragedies throughout history. In fact, in 1665 to 1666, the plague happened, the Black Plague, bubonic plague happened, and just tens of thousands of people died. And they found later on that it was because London had so many rats running around underneath London, and they actually had outlawed cats, thinking that cats were evil, which was kind of strange. But that produced more rats, and then on the rats were the fleas, and on the fleas were the bubonic plague, you know, the, the virus of the, the plague virus back then. And so it was a terrible place. People, so many people died. And then in 1666, right after this huge, huge uh, plague of rats, a great fire happened. And some people think it was good that that fire happened because that fire destroyed most of the rats. It was a huge fire and it was it started um, by the royal baker. The baker guy he, that cooks the meals for the royal family, you know, for the kings and the queens and the wealthy people. On September 2nd, 1666, um, his name was Thomas Farnor, and he lived on Pudding Lane. Um, he, he, the fire started, and, you know, he started the fire, he was, he was cooking away, and um, it got so bad that he had to crawl out one of the windows to escape. And he ran as fast as he could, trying to get help. And the wind was blowing so much that it started engulfing that part of the city. London had no fire department at all. And in fact, the volunteers came and they had leather buckets. They were trying to put out this fire with these little buckets and it didn't work. The mayor of London at that time, he thought it wasn't a very important fire, so he didn't call for help until the last moment. And then thousands of people fled from London because the everything started burning. The whole town started burning. Luckily, they had a lot of boats. They got on their boats, and they, they got on their river in the Thames River, and they left. The smoke could be seen from 60 miles away, and some of the buildings were even torn down to try to stop the fire. The fire burnt from Sunday afternoon until Thursday evening, and 80% of the city was destroyed, including St. Paul's Cathedral, that famous cathedral. In fact, the roof melted and ran down into the street. 84 of the huge, the, the royal buildings had been destroyed. 13,000 homes were burned. The London Bridge was, was at least half, almost halfway destroyed, if not a, not a third of it. Amazingly, the amazing thing about this, you would think a lot of people got caught in the fire and would die. Only 20 people died out of this huge city, but it left 100,000 plus people homeless. Then was the rebuilding. And the rebuilding, they came back and they looked on. The good thing, there weren't very many rats left at all. It stopped the plague in London, but it also, they needed to rebuild London, which took 50 years. They put a new tax on coal, coal to pay, pay for it, and there was a young man, and his name was Sir Christopher Wren. Last name, W-R-E-N. He was a mathematician, he was a scientist, he was an architect, and he was commissioned to rebuild, especially in rebuilding St. Paul's Cathedral, which they wanted to rebuild right away. But he also, he was commissioned to rebuild the city and 55 churches and buildings he helped even more. Um, he designed the city again to rebuild the city. Um, Christopher Wren was a great, great man of faith. He 
loved the Lord with all his heart and he put everything, the Bible says to do all for the glory of God and Christopher did all for the glory of God. It took 35 years to, to rebuild London from between 1675 and 1710. He used, went back and he used the Greek and Roman styles, the Baroque styles. He built two towers, um, had had a dome, eight arches, beautiful, beautiful St. Paul's Cathedral there. And he also put mosaics and fresnos and flying buttresses. And he had a special room he called the Whispering Room so that you could go in this room and that you could hear all around, 138 feet around. Um, he had gold built into it and huge works of art. And then when, when he died, they buried Sir Christopher Wren. They, called, they made him a knight and they buried him there underneath the church, St. Paul's Cathedral. It says, there's, there's an epitaph there at the church. It says, beneath lies buried the founder of this church and city, Christopher Wren, who lived more than 90 years, not for himself, but for the public good. Reader, if you see this monument, look around you. This is all that he built, the city of London he rebuilt. 9,000 homes were rebuilt in London, and they had now had to have brick in their homes, so they thought brick, the brick homes would, would not um, start on fire so easily. And they also, they also had, had other rules of cleanliness and other things. And they said that no building could build, be about taller than the, the Dome of St. Paul's until 1962. No building was big, taller than, than St. Paul's Cathedral. And they organized a huge fire department now. It was time for that, huh? So that was an important time of history for England and for London. But as we go on a little further, let's talk about another revolution. And we call this revolution the Glorious Revolution. How could it be any revolution be glorious? Because no one died, there was no wars, it just happened, a revolution happened, and it was, it was, it was without any problems. That's kind of unusual, isn't it? So we call this, this revolution was under Charles II, to remember first Charles II, that king that came back. Well, they thought he was like Protestant. They thought he was going to be with the Church of England. Then they thought maybe he'd be Puritan, but he was nothing. He decided that he was going to turn Catholic. And of course, in England, that was like, oh, not again. We have to fight again, the Catholics and the Protestants. And so, so he, he um, was going out to turn the monarchy back to Catholicism, but he died in 1685 before he was able, but his son, James II, um, inherited the throne, and he was openly Catholic. But his daughter, which her name was Mary of the Netherlands, she was very, very uh, Protestant and, uh, and living in the Dutch, the, the whole du as, the, as we know, most of the Dutch were Protestants, and she married William of Orange. We call them um, William and Mary of Orange in Orange, we think of Orange, I always think of Netherlands. And they came and they came and they took over um, the monarchy, which was her father, James. And they went to invade England, but James just fled the country. He decided he did not want to be king. And so they came and the parliament came and offered the throne to William and Mary. And they passed the Bill of Rights in 1684 to give the rights of the citizens to be whatever religion they wanted at that time. This limited the power of the monarchs, the kings and queens, to take over anymore and guaranteed individual liberty or freedoms to citizens, all citizens. They call this the glorious revolution, bloodless revolution, which means no blood was shed. And the monarch ruled with only the permission of the people in the parliament. They had to get along. The parliament had to get along with the monarchy together. And together they would rule, which they even do to this day. In 1701, we passed the law forbidding any um, Catholic king to come over and, and take over and say, everyone in our country has to be Catholic. They passed a law against that that said that would not happen again.
So we have some big things going on in London. If you go to London, you'll see a lot. I like that big London Ferris wheel I rode on that thing. It's amazing. I like to go to Buckingham Palace. That was pretty cool. And you see the and you see um, you know the guards there, you know, all dressed up in their English paraphernalia and such a such an amazing amazing place. Um, London has a lot of history, a lot of a lot of history, a lot of buildings to see, but a lot of history underneath um, London. And today, London being one of the old cities of Europe now. So anyway, that is the history of London. When I think about London Bridge, you know, it wasn't so spectacular, was it? Because here it is in Lake Havasu. But when I think about London Bridge and I think about the bridges of the world, I think how, you know, the true bridge is that Jesus bridged the gulf the gulf, I should say, of despair, the gulf of sin for us, that he made a bridge for us to go to heaven. It's a bridge divine. <laughs> no, we don't have a stairway of heaven trying to make our way to God, but we have this bridge divine. I like to walk across bridges sometimes, and I'll think about that, especially we live up here in California, and Forest Hill Bridge is like one of the tallest in the world, in the world you know, at least in the United States. <laughs> So anyway, well, I hope that everyone gets to visit London sometime. It's quite spectacular there. But the people of London, they need to go back to their first love. And they need to go back and remember their history and remember about Jesus. And Lord, I pray that the gospel would go back in London and England again. Because some of them have forgotten their roots. Huh? Have a good day.